in pro at a professional level as well. So um, thank you. The topic that you um, shared and said uh, and is really about revolution through education. And it's really a concept that uh, speaks to how societies are transformed in, uh, towards progress and equity. And whether a, it's formal or informal education, it is essential that, and, and the foundation of uh, building a better community. From my perspective, I look at education in a more uh, broader concept of beyond just going to school. Um, every facet of life and experience is educational and adds to the development of a human being and particularly for women and the importance and relevance of that. And so I, for my context, it is really about taking that broader view and taking it into account in terms of that, that training and skill development that is so essential in this community and here and the life experience that we get and learn uh, to inform the actions and possibilities and opportunities that people can ascertain. The value of education is something that really, once you have it, no matter what it is, no one can ever take from you. And that's why it is so essential for communities and individuals to make those kinds of investments in themselves and in, in, in future generations and communities and people as a whole for anyone because it's something that no one can ever take away from you in life. And it will always help you and guide you. So in my view, um, education is really a human right, and I don't think anybody can disagree with that. It is, the, it is something that everybody uh, should be able to access, and if, uh, if they so choose to seek that in whatever way that is. And that those who uh, erect roadblocks due to their fear of uh, losing control and power and wanting to deny the weak and vulnerable, and often uh, in many societies, unfortunately, those are women and children and girls, and, and you were speaking to that, um, from obtaining that um, is really unfortunate and uh, a sad state of affairs. The level of education, literacy, and the access to knowledge uh, defines a society and a community and a country, and we need to keep in mind of how those economic indicators and social in uh, indicators uh, reflect on the society as a whole and how they influence the future. There, um, there is a saying in my belief system that I am guided by and that inspires and, and, and it is, if you educate a man, you educate one. But if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And I, you know, this is a saying that is often not referenced in quote. <laughs> However, I do believe that it is very powerful and very relevant. Uh, it is important for us to invest in education and learning, for, for especially for our women and children um, and, and the girls, because they are uh, our future and the foundation of the community. And I know that Mr. Vetti is going to, and passionate, and you have chosen to leave Canada to do work elsewhere. I have chosen to stay in Canada and do work here because I really believe that this is my home and the context of saying I need to give back and ensure. So I think we have very common goals and purposes in the context of what we do and I think the collective is important because when you educate girls over there and they come here, then I take over. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> because that's the reality we face, right? So I know that you will be speaking eloquently about the work that you're doing and I encourage you to to grow and, and, keep, and not lose heart because it's not an easy journey. Um, I've, I've certainly been asked, uh, when I was talking to uh, Dr. Snehal, he had asked me to share some of my perspectives and experience and thoughts about how, uh, from a woman's perspective, and that's what I'm going to do in terms of how have we helped women uh, here integrate and um, um, become engaged and valued members of, of the community. So here in Canada or in Toronto or in GTA, whatever, um, we are really fortunate uh, to have access to education and institutions that assist individuals to seek uh, basic or higher education. Uh, albeit it may be getting harder because of the cost and um, becoming more um, unaffordable for some in terms of in many in, in parts of the community. But having said that, uh, to be able to access post-secondary education, at least there are systems in place to be able to um, access uh, those levels of education and for people who, should, who choose to do so. And I think more and more it's becoming um, more essential for them to do that. In addition, uh, for newcomers and immigrants here, it is imperative 
when you think about it, in the context of today's world, especially for women to educate themselves um, on the local cultural norms and enhance their skills in education and be participating members and develop their life skills and be able to be influencing the systems that exist because um, we are here to stay and this is our home and we need to make sure that there is a uh, balance between the work life and our culture and who we are and how we contribute to Canadian society. And that it is necessary um, in, uh, in print because it influences the way that our future generations will in fact be able to straddle and move forward. And it's the mothers and the women that actually influence that journey um, and that change their ways and let go um, and adapt. In today's knowledge economy, lifelong learning is critical, uh, not just for women, but for everybody, but particularly for women. Um, and in terms of being able, uh, critical to one's success and, and future advancement, especially in their careers. Um, the labor market demands greater skills and competencies to enter the workforce and to be able to retain jobs in their economic prosperity. Now some of you might have said, been there, done that, retired, who cares? And that's great, we all aspire to the Freedom 55 program. However, the reality is, if you're fortunate to have passed that stage of life and you're here and as, a, as a senior or as somebody who's, who's been there, done that, I think that the kinds of skills and experience that you retain and the capacity that you have in the community is, is underutilized and needs to be tapped into or in a way that can support the next generation because the times are different from when you came first and transitioned here. Many newcomers and immigrants continue to struggle and that journey is actually getting harder and harder here. And not only here, it's hard everywhere in the world. You know, when you look at the economic indicators and, and the way societies are in the pressure point. But when you translate that here, it's, it's um, quite significant and there's a misperception that there's no such need in, in here. That over the 25 years of my community work, I can tell you that it is becoming harder and more difficult and more complex. Um, as people are living in poverty, uh, and they truly are living in poverty, and not knowing when their next meal is coming, or how are they going to feed their children, and how are their children going to fit in. And there are many who are at risk and disadvantage from both economically and socially. And that they experience um, psychological um, and mental health issues, and that certainly just compounds their journey and uh, their success and goals in life. And are often um, underemployed, or even unemployed, to be able to even get a sustainable job many of the basics that we take for granted just because we live in Canada. Uh, many of us, I would say, in this room, as I look up and I, I see, I suspect, I have been quite fortunate from a personal experience that we haven't had to really maybe go to through those kinds of situations and journeys. And we've been fortunate. But that's not, not the case for a significant proportion of the population that belong to our community. Um, we and, and circumstances change and life experience reflects and as a result of that we might be on a, on a steady path and, it, and we can be destabilized in, in a flash. And so, you know, we are fortunate and yet we need to kind of think about how, um, how there are so many who are sadly not in the same realm as we are and continue to experience hardships on a daily basis and in many cases for many years. They're living in situations that you would never think um, even exist in Canada or in Toronto or in Peel. The uh, question really is that uh, we need to think about and ask ourselves, uh, how are we really helping them? What are we, gain what are we doing uh, or having done to assist them in moving forward? How have we helped educate them? How have we utilized our skills and our capacity and our network to be able to help them transition in order to uh, level the playing field uh, for women and their families and the generations to come. Uh, I know that in the GTA, GTA, one in five are affected by mental health issues, mental illness. One in nine are living in um, poverty and are dependent on social assistance support programs which are totally inadequate from a day-to-day -day existence point that that's all they can get. One in four are women who are affected by family violence. And you can imagine the impact of that on themselves and their homes and their children and future generations. The cycles that that perpetuates. 
30, about 35, 40 years, and uh, you know, in Canada when you came, and uh, though it took what three years to establish, um, for immigrants to establish themselves, to be able to integrate in society, and um, be able to have a, have a work in their chosen field of work, they had the qualifications in education, and they could easily transition in that in that way and get settled and uh, move on and become contributing members of society. I can tell you that in the past 30 years, 30 years sounds like a long time, but it's really not that far, with the different economic recessions and downturns that we had and the ups and downs in that, um, it has become harder and harder for families, and especially women, and to integrate uh, in both here and um, in terms of their day-to-day their -day life. Today, it's taking an average of seven to nine years for people to reach the same level, if at all. And um, with the pace of change, technological advancement, and the digital divide that now exists, that has, been, has taken our life and society by storm, and you can't go anywhere without a cell phone ringing, a smartphone happening, an app coming up every hour or every second of the day. Those kinds of changes and the, the, the digital divide is a huge factor in terms of what's impacting our society. And will so in terms of amongst generations as well as um, the haves and have nots in society. And that will be the dividing factor in terms of the future. But it is essential to think about you know, that immigrant experience and that newcomer experience, especially for women who are not enabled, but who are you know, needing to be encouraged to seek help, to be able to compete and to be able to adapt themselves in a manner that, and access the resources so that they can actually be able to just stay afloat in terms of competing and um, being um, valued members of society and not be left behind. And, and I think that the fact that it, education and training and those opportunities be accessed, but also that they are relevant uh, in, in, um, for them and not keeping them behind um, is, is essential. If you, um, so if you educate a man, you educate a woman. So from a society's point of view about where we want to be strategic in our priorities, Nothing wrong with that, absolutely, we have to educate men. But we also have to educate women and then focus. And if we can position ourselves as a community to think about what we're doing, I think that that is critical because when you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And so I, that was the question I asked earlier about how have we helped um, educate women to transition here. And that was why I was asked to comment about my experience and I'm going to share that with you. So how have I done this and how have we done this? So in 1987, um, we noticed a gap in uh, Peel at the time. We lived in Peel, moved from Toronto. And we, um, that there, was, there were no services available for our community at that time for newcomers. There was very little, if at all. And people were struggling. They had lots of issues. And the community was very small at the time. And we saw that uh, newcomers, uh, and men and women, uh, did not have the opportunities uh, to educate themselves about Canadian society, about what's available. They were struggling. They had no idea. And so it really began a journey where we thought, we need to do something. We need to kind of um, you know, help others. And in doing so, in the same passion about just having a desire to help, um, MCS was, was born. Um, and so and MCS was born, and um, we started to adapt and offer services. And it just started with the first about family support programs, women helping women, parenting programs, just started building our, our, our base in terms of responding to the needs as they came, and we started to develop those, the, that, that center in order to help, broadly speaking, uh, whoever could benefit from that help in that community in Brampton. Recognizing that this was a need when we established it, we established a not-for-profit center, really with no money, 